It's an interesting story. The Christ, Son of God, who sacrificed himself to save all mankind. Divinity made flesh. The terminal arm of the Trinity. But really, for us men, the relatable part of the story is his disciples, isn't it? Of course, you do know about his disciples, no? The men who followed him, the men who believed. Then you know of Peter, on whose back Christ's church was built, and Judas, who, with a kiss, betrayed him for thirty pieces of silver. It's fascinating to me how many people misinterpret the point of their story. Haven't you ever wondered why Judas, who only betrayed Christ once, is the fallen sinner of the story, and Peter is the redeemed? After all, Peter denied the Son of God three times, each denial a separate portrayal. Can you guess, detective, why the greater offender became a saint while the other hung from a tree? Judas, you see, he took the money. Hey guys, Professor Bill, Comic Book University, and I'm going to be doing a spotlight on story for the Black Monday murderers. Now, this is Image Comics, and this is a terrifyingly good set of comics. There's only eight issues out as of right now. That completes the first volume. Oh, it's going to continue. Guys, this is, it says words by, this was made by Jonathan Hickman. The uh, art is by Tom Coker. Colors, Michael Garland. Letters, Russ Wooten. This is essentially a story about human sacrifice, but who's? Guys, I can honestly say that this is one of the absolute greatest series of comic books that I have ever read, and each book is a hefty 52 pages or so. It is dense, and I mean that in more than one way. There is so much inside here. Now, we're going to start off in October of 1929, all right? And this is Black Thursday, October 24th, 1929. At the New York Stock Exchange at 9.42 in the a.m., they are selling, selling, selling on the stockroom floor. Just making some money, right? Money that doesn't actually exist. It's all inflated. If the stock markets were just gone, doesn't matter. We could still sell apples and oranges and pig bellies and all that other stuff, right? We could still sell those things and we could all survive. But somehow the rich... They just love the gamble of things that don't actually exist. Just the idea of them, which is sad. But this is the point that they're essentially trying to get across in some ways. And there's this man, Mr. Charles Ackerman, and he is a surprisingly real person. <laughs> You're going to hear this is a story about the Bischoffs, about the the Rothschilds and everything, and here is an Ackerman, and he is sitting at his desk, and he's given the early morning reports. While he's sitting there taking a look at them, he says to his butler, Milton, he's like, wait a second, can this be real? Is this, is this true? The butler says, yes. Now, why would you even ask that? Like, no, no, sir, well, it's not real. We gave you a false report just, you know, to mess with you. Anyway, so he's realizing that everything is starting to crash. Now, he is a little bit weirded out by this because somebody's supposed to tell him long in advance that this is happening. So, Charles is a little bit, you know, weirded out by this, but, you know, the butler's like, you know, are you going to be okay? He's like, listen, unlike my other partners, I actually worked for everything that I have. With my own two hands, I earned everything, okay? There is no luck involved in what I do. It's all hard work. And all of a sudden his nose starts to bleed and he's freaked. He realized that something's wrong and suddenly he blurts out something in an ancient Sumerian tongue that we don't really have access to. And everybody on the stockroom floor starts doing the exact same thing blurting out this strange ancient Sumerian nonsense, basically. And Milton's like, you know, sir, are you sure there's nothing I could do for you? He's like, it's not me, you fool. It's the money. Yeah. 
So there's another group of people in the other room, three more people, and each one of them has a different job. There's a fourth person also, and she is, for all intents and purposes, a demon. <laughs> there's something up with her. And he comes in, he's like, you know, what's going on? You know, uh, um, scale, didn't you, didn't you see this? So he pulls out a set of scales from a briefcase from a box and he's looking at it and he's like, oh, wow, how did I not see this? This is really weird. Is this a device? Is this, is this uh, something devised? Is this a plan? So anyway, um, a man goes and pulls out a spear and he's about to kill Mr. Anchorman. He's like, what are you doing? You know, are you, are you sure there's no other omens? There were no other omens? You're bleeding. That's all that matters. So he's like, go to hell. He's like, you first, but not alone. So he stabs him, kills him, dead. He's stripped naked, and you see all these ancient Sumerian, they look like hieroglyphs all over him, the ancient tongue written all over him. And they start throwing people out of the building. They start throwing them out onto the streets because they say that blood has to be paid. This is an insane comic book, an absolutely crazy insane comic book. They're throwing people out of the windows because blood has to be paid. And so they're trying to figure out what could have went wrong. How did we not see this? You know, what's, what's, what's going on? Like, I don't know. I don't know how he didn't see this. Is it, this is what it is. And Memon just simply wants his blood dues. And when he's aiming to collect, that's what has to happen. So, but this, while everything else will fall, and while this will spread all across the world, this institution will be fine because our blood has been paid. So, this book is going to continue changing and start giving you different... Uh, different accounts that will add to the story that will try to confuse you in some ways. Just don't let it. Read it with an open mind. Understand that some of this stuff is true. Some of this is truer. <laughs> so there are these four pillars, these four people who are in the room besides that demon chick. Anyway, there is the Watcher. All right. Uh, the Watcher is the one who basically sits and oversees certain aspects. There's the scales. The scales is the one who who determines the the um the the debt that is owed. You know, are we getting more than we're giving? Are we giving more than we're getting? That usually never happens. So he has to keep about an eye on the scales and and all that and, and check to see when Memon is about to collect. Now there's also the stone chair. The person in the stone chair is the person who, when Memnon col or Memon collects, that's the person who gets collected upon first. That was Mr. Ackerman. He sat on Earth, the stone chair. And then, of course, there's the ascendant seat. This person, for all intents and purposes, is in charge of everything. And when it's time to collect, he's the one who usually does the collecting. So this is an absolutely insane. They go into a, a story of every single person, every single person who was killed or who was in the, the stone chair at the very least, all of them. It's nuts. It's nuts. Uh, also, all four of these people who are representatives of their own house, their family, their clan, so to speak, they are going to get rotated out every four years. They'll, so one person stays in the stone chair for four years and then maybe becomes the, the watcher, then maybe becomes the, the, the scales. So there's always a, a, a shift. And if you just happen to be unlucky while you're in the, uh, the stone chair, there's somebody else in your family, you hope. So later on we see that a, uh, a detective comes into um, a man's office and says, uh, you know, Theo, you are back up. You are back to being a, um, a detective. So Mr. Uh, Theo Damas, he opens up his drawer and there's some files and there's his sidearm. And there's what looks like a, a tray, an ashtray full of cigarettes. No, it's actually bones. See, he is a Haitian and his grandmother practiced voodoo 
And several other people in his family practice voodoo also. And he's got a bit of a uh, 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 file here with a whole bunch of stuff that's redacted. And you'll see things that are redacted all the time. All the time throughout this comic book and all the successor comic books. So he's going to go and he's going to check out this case. When he goes and checks out this case, he is looking and he sees that a Mr. Rothschild has been killed. Yeah. Mr. Rothschild was killed recently and we're not sure by whom. Now, when he gets there, let me actually get to that page because I am skipping ahead a little bit, but I'll go back. Uh, when he gets there, he sees that uh, he is hanging. Uh, he, he's hanging by f uh, some ropes from the ceiling. And it's noted that uh, he, on all four sides of him, like that of a compass, there are four tables. On the table that is by his head, there are three... No, excuse me. On the table that is by his left arm, there are three wine glasses. On the table by his feet, there are six candles. There are nine books to his right, and by his head there are twelve chess pieces. Twelve, three, six, nine. You know what that is. It's a clock. And his arms are positioned in such that it states 8 o'clock. So Theo, uh, who everybody's a little bit curious about because he was just on desk duty for a long time, says, I'll be back at 8 o'clock. Why don't you clean all this stuff up for me? So they mention, you know, like, what did he get fired for? What, or excuse me, not fired. Uh, what exactly happened to him? He says, well, the thing that happened is Theo uh, is, is an amazing detective who could just figure out things that the rest of us are completely baffled by. Maybe it's the magic, who knows. But he is a ridiculously smart guy. He's unbelievably smart. He's and quick as a whip, you know, S smart's like a whip anyway. So um, at one point he was driving his, his car and he stopped and got out. And there's a person on the other end of the, uh, the street and he, he sees him the other side of the street. And he says, I see you. And this guy looks back at him and smiles. And Theo Dumas pulls out his gun and kills the man. So right away, he, he's like stopped. It's like, oh my God, we got to send him away and all this crazy stuff. But they go back to investigate everything. And, and they're going to go back and I guess, you know, see the, the, the parents, the wife, whatever, the, the next of kin at the apartment at his last known address. There are eight, excuse me, eight and a half human heads inside of his freezer. So the fact that Theo wound up killing a serial killer is what allows him to get desk duty instead of going to jail or whatever. Anyway, <clears throat> so that happens and he is put on desk duty for a month now. And he's got an early release because this is a very weird case. And he recognizes by sight that this is Daniel Rothschild. So it says a lot about him. Anyway, there is this man, Victor. And he is uh, a guest speaker at the uh, the local college, and they are, uh, excuse me, the Kane Can uh, Ken Crean Investment Bank, and he is giving a lesson. He's giving a lesson to these young students who are trying to figure out life, and he casts some kind of a. Well, anyway, he's talking, and, and some of them don't get it, so they're asking questions. Like, I don't understand. How is any of this legal? How, how is any of this possible? So he walks up to one of them, and he, he puts a single coin in her hand. It disappears. He opens the other, her other hand, and three coins fall out. He says, listen to me. Uh, for the, of, the, of the three coins, the one you started with, the one you're paying for, and the one for profit remember this. Then goes on and starts explaining other things to people and other things that will eventually come up in the, um, in the story. And he also seems to cast some kind of a spell involving the Sumerian words. So this is an absolutely crazy comic. There's so much going on. So much going on here. And there's an epilogue where <clears throat> the, um, the current, not sure exactly what he is, in this right now. Um, I know it's later on in the books, but this man has to go and find the sister 
of Mr. Rothschild, Mr. Daniel Rothschild, has to find her and say, hello, um, we need you to come back because your brother is dead. Can you do that? And she's got that same demon-style chick with her, which is, uh, she's freaky. She's genuinely freaky. <clears throat> now, the very, very end, there's like a double epilogue, is that Theo does go, Theo Dumas does go back to that uh, building, the scene of the crime. And while he's there, it's uh, just about 8 o'clock. When 8 o'clock shows up, the sun seems to reflect off of the windows. And it reflects in the form of one of those symbols, much like this one. So, <clears throat> every time we see that symbol, it says, All hail God Mam Mammon. Anyway, so this reflects, and when it does, he sees these strange markings on the wall. Guys, this is a crazy, insane comic book. Absolutely insane. And it's like, this is something that should definitely, definitely be some kind of a like Netflix series or something to that effect. It's insane what they're able to do with this. Jonathan Hickman is a genius by any means, any measure of the term. Now, as the comic goes on, you start to see more detective work. But the story isn't necessarily told through Detective Dumas. You'd figure that it is. In fact, the standard way that a story works is you're able to identify the hero, the protagonist, excuse me, of the uh, film or book or whatever. You find out what this person's goals are by listening to him, reacting, and, you know, the way he reacts and, and, and the things that uh, are done. And then you're able to put yourself in this position where you are now hoping that this person is going to be able to achieve those goals. That's not everything that's happening here. While we are learning a lot through him, we are also being told a different story by everybody else in this comic. It's very rare that you can have, I mean, think about it. Oftentimes you'll have um, a story like... Superman. You know that Superman is the hero because the story is named after him, right? And we're always learning things through Superman. It's, it's, it's rare that there's something else in a story for too long because we're trying to follow Superman, right? And anything else that happens is supposed to be connected to Superman. So likewise, in most comics, that's the situation. In most mediums, uh, in, including TV, radio, uh, literature, we have the exact same situation. Somehow, Mr. Hickman was able to write a book where there doesn't seem to be any one hero. We're, sometimes we're following the antagonist. And it's crazy because now we're able to, in a way, root for them all. Because each one of them seems to have a definable goal. But it's all terrifying. And when they meet with each other, when some of these characters meet with each other, you feel like, you genuinely feel in your heart that something is going to go down. Sometimes it does. Sometimes there's a much bigger threat. This is an amazing comic book, guys. And I highly recommend it. There, are, Like I said, there are eight currently. And this is the 4th of, of uh, March, 2018 that I am actually doing this. So, and, and this will go up much later on, of course, but this is absolutely amazing story. I highly recommend this is Image Comics. It's called Black Monday Murders. Whew. Absolutely crazy. The art will blow you away. I don't know what else to say about this. Guys, you can check out the description. There's uh, links below so that you can get the books in and of themselves. That's it for me, Professor Bill, Comic Book University. Class dismissed.